If you would take your Bibles with me this morning, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1 this morning and reading on to verse 11. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. You know, you look at this this passage, and it's intriguing because this is right before Jesus began His ministry. Right before He started it. Before everything happened that God ordained to happen, before everything happened that people's lives were touched and people were healed, Satan tested Christ. But he didn't come to him right away. He waited till Christ was weak and hungry as a man. Forty days in the wilderness without food or drink. I'd be weak too. Then here Satan comes to him. And he starts telling him things that that he can do. He's God. He can do it. And Satan tells him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to be bred. First of all, there shouldn't be an if in that sentence. He is the Son of God. But maybe we should take a step back and ask ourselves, why did Jesus go in the wilderness to begin with? Why did He go to be tempted by the devil for 40 days? Was it not the order of God that He did so? For in Hebrews it states that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our needs. He was tested in every single way that we are tested. He is tempted in every single way that we ourselves are tempted. And here He goes out into the wilderness and Satan says, you can end all this right now. If you are really the Son of God, command this stone to be bred. Your hunger will be over. Your strength will return. This is a good thing. Remember back in the Garden of Eden when Satan tempted Eve? The way he tempted her was to start questioning what God said. And notice how Christ responds to his first temptation. He comes back and he tells Satan, it is written. Boy, that's a good line right there. Tells us everything we need to know in those three words, doesn't it? It is written. I don't survive by bread alone, devil. I survive by every word that proceeds from God the Father. Then Satan, he gets tricky. He's a crafty, crafty fella. Here he comes back again. And Satan, this time when he tempts Christ, he quotes Scripture back to Jesus. That's scary, isn't it? Not only does Jesus know Scripture, Satan knows Scripture. He quotes part of Psalm 91 to him. He says, here's what you need to do, Lord. Here's what you need to do, Jesus. He says, let's go up to this really high place, to the pinnacle of the temple. And he says, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. 
and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. That's Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. But here Jesus comes back in verse 7 and He says, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He comes back again. He gives Him more Scripture. And He says, Satan, while, you're, while you know Scripture, you don't use it correctly. You twist it and pervert it. You conveniently forget that we are not to tempt God the Father. It is written again. The last temptation that He throws at Christ was to show Him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And He says, if you will just bow down and worship Me, I'll give it to you. You know, this is kind of a, a, a silly temptation in my mind. Because God already owns everything. But see, in weakness... In temptation, the flesh gets mighty, mighty weak. And sometimes things don't make sense anymore. All he needs is a moment, just a, a crack in the door to get a hold on you. But Jesus in His strength again comes back and He tells Satan, get away from me. And He leaves. You know, this was something the Lord warned us about in Scripture because if you go back, if you go back to Matthew chapter 26, Peter fell into the same trap. Here they were at the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was about to be turned over to the, to, the, to the Sadducees and the Pharisees to be crucified. And He asked His disciples, Peter in particular, that inner circle, He asked them, stay up and pray with Me. In other words, My flesh is struggling. My flesh is weak. Stay up and pray with Me. What happens? Everybody remembers. Peter fell asleep i can't blame peter just the other night my wife asked me stay up and watch a show with me i fell asleep five minutes into it i don't blame him man's tired man's tired you fall asleep but here jesus comes back and he tells peter in verse 41 matthew 26 verse 41 he says watch and pray lest you enter into temptation the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak these aren't just words. Jesus did the exact same thing in the wilderness. The exact same thing. What did Jesus do? After 40 days of fasting, having nothing to drink, nothing to eat, He watched and He prayed. And when Satan came to tempt Him, He was prepared and He stood. He stood as God, God the Father. He stood as the God-man. He stood. And he did not give in to temptation. Now he's telling Peter the secret recipe. He said, this is how I did it in the wilderness when I was tempted by Satan himself. He says, you've got to watch, Peter. You've got to pray. The Spirit is indeed willing. Your heart may want to serve me, Peter. You may have a desire to do the things of God. But if you don't watch and pray, you're going to fall before you get very far. You're going to fall flatter than a pancake. You're going to fall. I remember when I was teaching my boys how to ride a bicycle. And I told them, I got them on their bike. They've been riding on tricycle, or uh, uh, they had the wheels on the back just to kind of help them steady for a while, training wheels. And I took those training wheels off and I set them in the yard and they got mad at me. They said, Dad, we can ride our bike. We can ride on the street. We can ride on there. I said, No, no, no. That's a bad idea. Bad idea. They said, yeah, Dad, you've seen us do this a thousand times. I said, with training wheels. This is different. I said, when you get on this bike, son, there's only two wheels, and you're going to fall. I promise you, you're going to fall. But it's going to be okay, because I got you on the grass. Just kept, try to ride a little bit. You're going to fall, but get back up, try again. And sure enough, sure enough, I would send them on their way. They'd go a few feet, and boom. I get them back up, I dust them off, bring them back to the edge of the yard. It's okay, we're going to try again. You're getting the hang of it. We're good. And they try again. We did it a couple times. I told them, I said, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go in the house for a minute and talk to your mom. I said, you keep out here. You keep practicing. You're going to get the hang of it. I go inside for a little bit. 
I come back out, I can't find them. I'm like, where did they go? There's the bike lane in the yard. I said, where did they go? I go looking for them. They're inside doing something else. I said, what are you doing? They said, it wasn't working. I said, what do you mean it wasn't working? They said, Dad, we can't do it. The Spirit is indeed willing. The flesh is weak. Dad, we keep falling over. We can't do it. I said, son, there's a trick. There's a trick to riding a bicycle. And I said, I, honestly, there's two. There's two tricks to it. And they're all excited. Oh, what's the trick? I said, well, one, you got to be on it. I said, that's trick number one. You got to get on the bike. And I said, two, you got to keep trying even if you fall. You got to keep trying even if you fall. You see, what Jesus did in the wilderness was He gave us an example of what it is to fast and pray and why we fast and pray. The example given was that we go through a time where we just contemplate on the Lord. We remove everything else from the equation. We don't eat. We don't drink for a period of time. We don't watch TV for a while. We get away from it all to focus on our walk for God. Why? To prepare for the battle that lies ahead. To prepare for the battle. You don't know when the battle's coming. All we know is that it's coming. And in order to stand in that battle, you have to prepare yourself for it. You have to bring the flesh into obedience to the Spirit. That's what Jesus did in the wilderness. He started bringing the flesh into submission to the Spirit. The flesh was weak. The flesh wanted the rock to be bread. Oh, you better believe it. I want the bread. The flesh wanted to know I'm going to be safe. I want to know I can throw myself off this pinnacle and God's angels will catch me. The flesh wanted to know I can live in luxury. I don't have to roam through the wilderness all the time and go without food and water and not have a place to lay my head. But the Spirit says that's not God's plan. You obey the Spirit of God no matter where it leads you. Jesus brought the flesh into obedience to the Spirit of God. When you turn and you go on into the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is now teaching Peter, I'm not going to be with you always, Peter. So let me remind you of this. There's going to be moments where you're tired. There's going to be moments where you want to quit. There's going to be moments where it's unpleasant for you. Peter, watch and pray. Your spirit will always be willing to follow me. But the flesh, the flesh is going to be weak. Peter, prepare yourself because there will be a battle between the two. When we go further in Scripture and we continue to look at this, take your Bibles with me and go on over to Isaiah chapter 58. Go ahead and turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 58, starting in verse 3. Isaiah 58, starting in verse 3. It says, why, why have we fasted, they say, and have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls, and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure, and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate, and strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. It is a fast that I have cho is it a fast I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread a sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day of the Lord? Is this not the fast I have chosen, to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens? to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. It is, not, is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring, your house to, bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked to cover him, and hide yourself, and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spread forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be 
your rear guard. Let's stop there for a moment. Listen to this explanation of fasting. God is correcting through the prophet Isaiah, the nation Israel, saying you're fasting to gain an advantage, to be seen by others, to make it obvious. And that's not the fast I've chosen for you. He says to the contrary, the fast I've chosen is to what? To loosen the bonds of wickedness. To set you free. What did Jesus do when He walked in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights? He showed us how to get victory over the flesh. To bring it fully into the obedience of God the Father and the Spirit of God. To meditate on the Word of God. To pray. To fast for a while. And focus solely on God. I tell you what church, we are surrounded by nothing but distractions all through this life. Distractions absolutely everywhere you look. We turn on the TV to try to disengage and relax. Distraction. We engage in in wild conversations about a whole range of topics. Distraction. An election year. Boy, that's a big distraction. Everything around us is nothing but a distraction. But what a fast does is it forces you to look inside. It forces you to examine things that you do not want to examine. It forces you to spend time with God in such an intimate way that it brings out the depths of your soul. And you realize then exactly what you need to do in the Scriptures that apply and how they apply. And it draws you deeper in your walk for God. And He tells us, He says, this may not be pleasant to the flesh, but what this does is it breaks the bonds of wickedness. It sets the captives free. It undoes heavy burdens. And he says, this is the fast that I have chosen for you. For too long, for too many years, we've taken our Christian faith of something that's touchy-feely and feels good and makes us feel somehow elevated and empowered. Hogwash. That's a bunch of hogwash. The Christian faith brings power when we submit to the authority of God. When I don't do the thing that feels good, but I do the thing that God commands. And in that, God blesses and starts breaking bonds in my life. He breaks the bondage of things that I don't know are holding me bound. I had a man one time, he gave me a visual, he challenged me in a lot of ways. And he looked at me, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, if you were to take a bird that flies around outside and it knows freedom and you were to put it in a cage, would it know that it was in a cage? I said, well, yes. Yes, it would. He said, but what happens if that bird was born into captivity and it never knew what it was like to fly free? Would that bird know that it was in a cage? I said, well, probably not. He said, so then ask me or answer this question for me. He said, how do people know that they are in bondage unless they are shown that they are in bondage? That's a biblical teaching. How do I know? How do I know where I stand with God if I do not take the time to spend solely with God? To push out all the distractions and say, Lord, it's just me and you. It's just me and you. For 40 days, Jesus went in the wilderness bringing the flesh under obedience to God the Father to say, I will do the will of the One who sent me. And then Peter. Peter was told by God to stay up and pray. Peter already confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Peter already believed in all that Christ was teaching. Peter was already told by Christ, upon this rock I will build my church. And now he's asked by God the Father, I want you to stay up and pray with me. Pray with me. And Peter falls asleep. Bear in mind, Peter was told that he would deny Christ three times before that day was over. And Peter fell asleep. Guess what happens afterwards? 
Jesus warns him. We don't take it as a warning, but it is. He says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. What did Peter do? Well, for one, he cut the ear off of the high priest's servant. And Jesus chastised him because he was wrong. In the next case, he denied Christ three times and wept bitterly and thought there was no redemption for him. Jesus warned him. He said, Peter, Peter, watch and pray. Because if you don't, you're going to fall into temptation. Peter, your spirit is willing to follow me and I see it. But your flesh is weak. But your flesh is weak. Sometimes I don't think my flesh is that weak at all. I think I'm doing pretty good. I think I'm doing great. I'm going through, I may be working all week, I'm shedding a few pounds, boy, I feel good. You folks know what I'm talking about, right? You do, I know you do. Shed a few pounds, you feel great. Boy, I am doing good. And I am out, and I'm working, I'm working up a sweat, and I'm thinking, man, I'm feeling good. Shedding some pounds, gaining some muscle, I feel great. And I walk in the house, and I smell something. Miranda's baking cookies. Those cookies smell really good. I mean, they are. If you've not had her cookies, they are delicious. She's baking cookies, and they smell good. And I go, I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not doing that. I feel good. I've lost weight. I'm doing great. I go outside. I start working again. I get my mind right. And then one of the kids come out, and they're eating a cookie. Boy, that cookie looks awful good. So I decide, I'm like, okay, okay, I got it, I got it, I got this under control. I'm going to get a glass of milk and one cookie. That's healthy. That's healthy. That's not bad. I'm a big guy. I can handle a cookie. Cookies are like crack. You get one, you want more. It's like people dealing drugs at the school. Here, just have a taste. It's okay. I want more. It's a cookie. And before I'd known it, I've eaten like 15 cookies and a glass of milk. And I think of this verse and it says, the spirit is willing. My spirit was to stay outside and work. My spirit was to lose weight and stay fit and do what's right. My flesh wanted a cookie. I ate the cookies. You know, it's comical, but it it is the truth, is it not? It is the truth. Spiritually, sometimes it helps if we can laugh just a little bit to get the truth in us. We want the cookies. But Christ tells me, He says, listen, He says, I get it. The flesh, it is weak. But you've got to learn to deny it. You've got to learn to live for the Spirit. As a matter of fact, when we go further in Scripture, we'll close with this passage. But if you want to go to Matthew chapter 6, this is what Christ even tells us about fasting. And this is an important note while we're on the topic. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 16. It says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in a secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. God doesn't want you to be all humdrum and down. He doesn't want that. God tells us in His Word that He's come to bring us life and to bring it more abundantly. But if you want that abundant life in Christ, there are certain things that we have to learn to do. In church, one of the most important things is to deny what feels good to the flesh. To to deny it and say, no, I'm going to live for Jesus. 
the scriptures state that God was a man of sorrows, that he was acquainted with grief. You look at what Jesus went through. He understands. For 40 days, 40 days he went without food and water to prepare his body for the cross. To prepare his body for the onslaught that Satan was going to throw at him on his journey. You look at his life, all three years of ministry, look at his life. People hated him, mocked him, ridiculed him. They tried to stone him. And we ask why. I believe in large part it was an effort by Satan to make him see that we were not worth the cost. That we weren't worth it. For 40 days he prepared himself to say no matter what this body goes through, I will obey the Father. I will complete the mission I was sent here to do. Even if it is painful. And every day He brought the flesh under obedience and He walked in the Spirit. When He spoke to Peter, it wasn't way up here. It wasn't to say, I'm above it all. When he spoke to Peter, it was eye to eye. And he says, Peter, I know how painful it is. Music can make your way forward. I know how painful it is. I've been where you are. I have desired sleep. I have desired peace. And I've had to say no to be obedient to the cross, to obedient to the Father. And he says, Peter, I'm telling you. I'm telling you this, Peter. you got to listen to it. Your spirit will always be willing to follow me. But your flesh is going to fight you every step of the way. Your flesh is going to fight you in every single step. Peter, be a man who watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Temptation looks sweet when it's at the door. It's awful when it gets inside. Church as believers, we're being surrounded by a world today that's full of nothing but temptations. Absolutely everywhere you look, everybody's trying to pull you away from the teachings of Jesus Christ. Telling you, this is okay. This is acceptable. You can do this and be right with God. But I want to come back to the words of Jesus. I want to come back to what God the Father told me. There's no substitute for His Word. There's no substitute for His commands. What He states is law. And He tells us that my flesh must come under obedience to God. It can't do its own thing. Through life, I want a lot of things. I want the cookie. But if I take it, I know that there are things that I'm going to miss out on. I overindulge in those things. I'll never get fit and right. I'll never lose the weight I want to lose. God says, if you want to serve me, you're going to have to start letting go of things in this world. You're going to have to start looking inside to the most hidden recesses of your life and start allowing me to break the chains that bind you. For many of us here today, many of us in this congregation, we have no idea what chains we're fighting. Not one. Because it's been hidden so deep inside of us for so long we don't even know that it's there anymore. We're like a bird that's been born into a cage. We think we're free. In reality, we're bound up. But God says that if we take the moment, if we start fasting and praying, and we start allowing Him to show us what's in here, He says, I'll break the chains that bind you. I'll set the prisoners free do that church you're going to have to take a hard look inside you're going to have to see things that you don't want to see 
When Jesus went to the wilderness for 40 days, he felt the pain. The man felt pain. But he knew the reward that was waiting on the other side. Never forget, God made you a promise. He said, I've come to give you life. And I've come to give it more abundantly. He didn't come to take it away. He's come to give you something that you've never experienced before. So much better than you could ever possibly imagine. He says, this is the first step. The first step to get well in Jesus Christ. My boys teach him to ride a bike. I put the training wheels on. I said, this is the first step. When they mastered that, I took the training wheels off. I said, time for round two. Time for the next step. And each and every day of their life, there's going to be a next step. There's going to be a next step. There's going to be more falls. There's going to be more struggles. But it's essential to get to that next step, to that next part of their life that God's waiting to bring them to. And every single time, they're going to see a victory. Every single time, they're going to see something great. Because God is only going to move them to something better. The next time, and the next time, and the next time, and the next time. You say, Pastor, life doesn't work that way. In Christ, when your focus is on Jesus, it does work that way. Because every day is new in Jesus. And no matter how bad the day may be, I know in Jesus that the morning is going to break. And He tells me that joy, joy comes in the morning. So this evening, or this morning, I challenge you, whatever needs you have, whatever prayer you need to pray, maybe you've never fasted a day in your life and you feel God calling you to take a fast. Church, I'm going to tell you something. You will not experience anything greater than spending time in a fast with your Savior, Jesus. You will experience Him in ways that you've never experienced Him before. Whatever need you have, whatever prayer you need to pray for anything God has laid on your heart this morning, this altar is open. For any need you have, I invite you. Please come.